I'll tap derivatives into a LinkedIn people search. A million people turn up. That's roughly the population of Dallas, Texas. If you're amongst those million and you use the ISDA master agreement or ISDA documentation, then you'll need to know about initial margin for uncleared derivatives. If you're involved in derivatives at a financial institution, asset management firm, pension fund, or insurance company, and required to post or receive initial margin from 2019 or 2020, then you really need to know about initial margin for uncleared derivatives. To get the benefit of this video lecture, though, you will need a strong foundation in the ISDA Master Agreement and its credit support annex. What follows is best suited to those already familiar with global margin reform, those who have previously followed the variation margin or VM reforms which applied from March 2017 and want to learn about the IM reforms, and those who may be involved in implementing an initial margin project in 2019 and 2020. This video focuses on the rules and provides an overview of the documentation required for IM. I'm Edmund Parker, Global Head of Derivatives at Mayor Brown, and as part of my practice, I focus on the implementation of initial margin requirements as part of the global margin reforms. Initial margin for uncleared derivatives is the exchange of collateral to guard against the margin period of risk. The margin period of risk is known in the market as MPOR, and it's the liquidation period which begins with the last exchange of collateral supporting exposures under an ISDA master agreement until, following an early termination date, that posted collateral is realised and invested in rehedged transactions. Initial margin requirements for uncleared derivatives, IM, sit alongside variation margin for uncleared derivatives, VM. VM is the collateral posted under an ISDA credit support annex to cover immediate default risk for the same exposures under an ISDA master agreement. The default risk, collateralised by initial margin and variation margin requirements, is that when an ISDA master agreement is closed out following an event of default or termination event, the party closing out will need to enter into replacement hedging transactions in substitute for the ones it has closed out there will either be a profit or loss from arranging this. A default risk exists if the party closing out the transaction is net out of the money, i.e. it will, on a gross basis, have to pay replacement counterparties to enter into those transactions on the same terms. The variation margin reforms compelled the world's largest derivative users to add credit support annexes to the ISDA master agreements they had with each other. This forced them to post collateral against default risk exposure in accordance with globally agreed parameters. It also meant that when an event of default or termination event occurred under an ISDA master agreement, the party closing out could apply collected variation margin against a positive mark-to-market -market exposure. Where the closing out party calculates that its transactions have a negative mark-to-market -market value, i.e. replacement counterparties would pay to enter into replacement transactions on the same terms, it will instead apply posted amounts of collateral against the closeout amount it is required to pay. MPOR, the margin period of risk, encompasses the risk that there is not enough collateral posted as VM. Counterparties are most likely to default at times of extreme market stress. This can mean it takes longer to put replacement transactions in place, that pricing is more volatile, and that the value of collateral posted is less than expected. So initial margin IM requirements under global margin reform rules require counterparties to post and collect additional collateral to act as a buffer to cover those risks. The extra collateral is posted and segregated by each party. IM and VM, how did we get here? After the 2008 Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, politicians and global regulators saw global margin reform as essential to safeguarding the financial system. What began at the September 2009 Pittsburgh G20 meeting as a declaration by financial ministers to shift standardised OTC derivative contracts onto exchanges and central clearing evolved into a demand at the 2011 G20 meeting in Cannes for standards to be developed by the Baal Committee on Banking Supervision 
and the International Organization for Securities Commission to develop standards on margining for non-centrally cleared OCC derivatives. The standards were finalized as the BCBS IOSCO Final Framework on Initial Margin Requirements for Non-Centrally Cleared Derivatives and established phased-in international standards known as the Uncleared Margin Rules. They contained the two elements of posting variation margin and initial margin. The standards were implemented by regulations in each jurisdiction by legislation. These were done under the Dodd-Frank rules in the United States, where the prudential regulator and CFTC margin requirements require swap dealers registered with the CFTC to post and collect IM, and through regulatory technical standards under EMIR for the European Union. Similar rules implemented the standards in other key jurisdictions, such as Japan, Hong Kong, Canada, Singapore and Asia. Each of the jurisdictions has, however, implemented the rules slightly differently. But the key element of all of the standards are A, they hit the biggest derivative market players, and B, that for IM, they do that in five progressive annual rounds, affecting the biggest first and gradually encompassing more counterparty groups. The requirement to exchange IM has been phased in across the European Union from March 2017 and the United States from September 2016, capturing counterparties with the largest derivatives portfolios first, but eventually covering counterparties with 8 billion euros or equivalent threshold gross notional amount of outstanding uncleared OTC derivatives. Where a counterparty has a gross notional amount of uncleared OTC derivatives at the relevant thresholds, IM in the form of eligible collateral must be exchanged both ways between counterparties. The transfer must be made on a gross basis, i.e. free of set-off. IM must be calculated on the basis of set methodology, then segregated into a third-party account backed by a custodial structure established by the leading custodians. The Phase 1 counterparties comprised the largest derivative dealers in global finance. From September 2016 in the United States and February 2017 in the European Union, these Phase 1 counterparties agreed and executed IM documentation with all of the other Phase 1 dealers. This was a tough process, not least because a tight regulatory timeline ran alongside a race to create market standard template documentation. Looking at the chart here, you can see that an average aggregate notional amount of outstanding derivatives of 3 trillion euros was required to get a financial institution group into the Phase 1 club. The Phase 2 counterparties became in scope in September 2017. Few in number, they had to put IM compliant documentation in place with firstly all of the phase one counterparties and secondly with the phase two counterparties that each had existing derivatives arrangements with them. Those with 2.25 trillion euros average aggregate notional amount outstanding of derivatives fell in scope within phase two. The Phase 1 and Phase 2 dealer groups were joined on 1st September 2017, the Phase 3 phase-in date, by a handful of further institutions. The threshold moved down from 2.25 trillion euros to 1.5 trillion euros. As the threshold lowers, the range of financial institutions in scope begins to diversify, and in 2017 it included the first buy-side entity. Estimates vary, but with a threshold of 750 billion euros, there may be as many as 70 newly in scope counterparty groups in phase four, which commences and comes into force on 1st September 2019. As with earlier phases, the phase four counterparty groups will need to enter into IM compliant document sets with paired entities in counterparty groups in their own phase 
and also earlier phases. Phase five, the final phase coming into effect on 1st September 2020, affects counterparties with a gross notional amount of uncleared OTC derivatives at a measurement point above 8 billion euros. Some estimates place the number of affected counterparty groups as high as 1,200. Am I in or out of scope for a particular phase? That's one of the big questions for any counterparty group. The rules require counterparty groups to look at the aggregate average notional amount of outstanding covered derivatives for the last business day of March, April and May of each year for all entities in the group measured over the observation period. Covered derivatives include all non-cleared derivative transactions, including intra-group transactions, counting these only once. Generally speaking, the calculation captures all entities which consolidate into financial statements. The calculation is complicated by moving exchange rates and applicable thresholds applying in different currencies depending on the applicable regime. For example, United States dollars for Dodd-Frank and euros for EMEA. Up on the diagram here is an illustration of how IM is held. This diagram will apply for each pairing between counterparty groups. We have two counterparties. Looking here at the top part of the diagram, party A posts its IM amount to a secured account with its custodian. Party A is called the pledgeor or chargeor. The amount of IM which must be posted is determined under either an approved model such as SIM or by the regulatory prescribed table, which is known as the grid or the schedule. SIM, the standard initial margin method, is a scalable and stress-tested model which involves calculating the margin to be posted based on risk factors and agreed data sources. A security interest or pledge over the IM and account with the custodian is granted to party B. Party B is the secured party. Looking at the bottom part of the diagram, party B is also required to post IM to its custodian. It may be the same custodian or it may not be. For example, party A's custodian could be the Bank of New York Mellon and party B's custodian could be Euroclear. The two sets of posted IM cannot be netted against each other. They must be segregated. Party B will also post its initial margin to an account held with its custodian. Under this arrangement, Party B will be the pledgeor and Party A the secured party. IM is only required to be posted between paired counterparties with an exposure threshold exceeding $50 million for the United States margin regulations and 50 million euros for the EU margin regulations. The exposure is achieved on a shared basis across counterparty groups. This means that a counterparty pairing can be required to put a full infrastructure package in place even though there's a relatively thin trading base and the threshold may never be met. This is a more detailed slide showing an IM bilateral arrangement, but highlighting the documentation. These parties will have an is the master agreement in place between them. Under this sits a collateral agreement. Each of party A and party B will put an a collateral agreement in place. Where a party has appointed a custodian other than Euroclear or Clearstream, the collateral agreement is an IM credit support deed, which establishes I am arrangements for uncleared swaps. This is represented in the diagram by the box titled Custodian 1 IM CSD. This collateral agreement is adapted from the 1995 ISDA credit support deed. As with the 1995 ISDA credit support deed, the document is in standalone format and is not an annex to the ISDA Master Agreement. The credit support deed 
is referred to as a CSD when it is governed by English law. When it is governed by New York law, it is called a credit support annex and it is in a form adapted from the 1994 ISDA New York Law Credit Support Annex. Where the custodian is Euroclear or Clearstream, the collateral agreement is a collateral transfer agreement, a CTA in the case of Euroclear or Clearstream. This is represented in the diagram by the box titled Custodian 2 CTA. Under the collateral agreement, the charge-or charges the segregated accounts and any collateral in them in favour of the secured party and assigns the charge-or's assigned rights to the secured party. These assigned rights are defined as all present and future rights relating to the collateral which the charge-or has against the securities intermediary or any third party. Each custodian will put in place a bilateral custody agreement between it and the pledgeor, which will govern the arrangements for holding an account. This is represented in the top left and the bottom right corners of the diagram in the yellow and green boxes. The custody agreement is a bilateral agreement which establishes the custody relationship with the party posting collateral, the chargeor, and the custodian. The custody agreement also provides for the opening of segregated accounts to hold IM collateral. The accounts are used for transfers by the chargeor of eligible collateral under the collateral agreement. Each custodian will also put in place a security agreement which provides the custodian in its capacity as securities intermediary with the security required for supporting a chargeor in the three-way arrangement. Finally, all custodians will also put in place three-way account control agreements. The parties to the account control agreement are the charge or the secured party and the securities intermediary. So the charge or is the collateral provider pledging the IM which is the subject of the CSD or the CTA. The secured party is the collateral receiver and receives IM by way of pledge from the chargeor and the securities intermediary is the custodian holding the IM in its accounts. Following a termination event or event of default on the, the ISDA master agreement, the custodian may only release the IM as provided and permitted in the ACCA, more of which later. The ACCA also provides that the secured party is prohibited from rehypothecating, repledging, or reusing or transferring collateral held in the account from time to time through securities lending, securities borrowing, repurchase agreements, reverse repurchase agreements, or by other means. The next two slides demonstrate the complex jigsaw which makes up the documentation package. The diagram shows the documentation package where one party has appointed Euroclear as its custodian and the other party has appointed BNY Mellon as its custodian. Where the party is based in Europe, it will document its collateral agreement as the collateral poster under English law. And where the party is based in the United States, it will document its collateral agreement under New York law. At the top is the ISDA master agreement and schedule between Party A and Party B which will govern all of their ISDA governed uncleared derivatives transactions. In the second row on the left side for the party which has appointed Euroclear an IM CTA is put in place under English or New York law. For the party appointing BNY Mellon if the governing law of its collateral agreement is New York law then a credit support annex is put in place with its counterparty. And if the collateral agreement is governed by English law, then a credit support deed is put in place. On the far right of the second row, there will be at least one further credit support annex. A single CSA will be in place to cover variation margin requirements, 
i.e. the variation margin requirements put in place for counterparties on 1st March 2017. As these rules only apply to transactions entered into after 1st March 2017, there will also be a legacy CSA for all transactions entered into before then. Looking at the Euroclear side of the slide, a Belgian security law agreement is in place which integrates with a further set of Euroclear documents, the operating procedures of the Euroclear system, the collateral service agreement, which is the equivalent of the account control agreement, and the terms and conditions governing the use of Euroclear. Moving to the BNY Mellon side of the diagram, BNY Mellon has an account control agreement, security agreement, and custody agreement in place. The scale of the task of complying with IMSEG requirements can be massive. We have just been through the documentation requirements for a single pairing, but this documentation infrastructure arrangement must be put in place for each pairing between counterparty groups. So a phase four counterparty may have 10 in scope entities within its counterparty group, which are having to put in place IM documentation platforms with other paired counterparties. On a micro level, this in scope counterparty may find that it has five different ISDA master agreements in place with a phase two counterparty. These could be with diverse members of the group, perhaps a bank in Brazil, an asset manager in Ireland, the parent bank in France and two others. It's possible that the matched entities have appointed multiple custodians too. So a phase four or phase five in scope counterparty may find itself putting hundreds of documents in place. Let's take a look at the credit support deed in a little more detail. A proper detailed review will be the subject of a later video. The IM credit support deed is based on the 1995 ISDA credit support deed. It was rather like the at and hashtag symbols on a keyboard, of limited usage until brought in and revitalized by a new technology. The IM credit support deed has some important key features. It also has some important differences with its predecessor. These include provisions for determining the types of trade caught by IM requirements, the covered transactions, determining how IM must be held, the transfer provisions, provisions for the prevention of rehypothecation, for using segregated accounts and custody arrangements, determining the frequency of IM exchange, determining the amount of IM to be posted through definitions of credit support amount, margin amount, and minimum transfer amount. Providing for what type of collateral can be delivered, i.e. what is eligible collateral and what is ineligible collateral, and determining which regulatory regimes apply. A collateral agreements regime table allows the parties to comply with the multiple regulatory regimes which may apply under one agreement. For example, a party may be based in the United States and so need to comply with the Dodd-Frank rules. Its counterparty may be based in Spain and need to comply with EMIR. Other regimes may also require compliance where members of the group are based in another jurisdiction. So the collateral agreement will provide that I am exchanged must meet the requirements of each regime applying to the parties. A regime table in the schedule to the credit support deed or collateral agreement allows the parties to elect whether a regime is applicable or not applicable for each party. Where two regimes conflict, the strictest of the regimes apply. The most important provisions in the account control agreement are those which provide access to the posted initial margin. As either the charge or, or the secured party may be the defaulting party or affected party under the ISDA master agreement, different provisions apply. The applicable events of default and termination events are specified in the ISDA master agreement schedule. These are NEC events. 
if an NEC event occurs in relation to the charge or and an early termination event occurs, the secured party may deliver a notice of exclusive control to the securities intermediary. Upon receipt of the notice of exclusive control, the securities intermediary must promptly notify the chargeor by sending an email to the chargeor's default email address. After delivering the notice, the secured party may exercise sole and exclusive control of the accounts. The securities intermediary must, in reliance upon the secured party's notice of exclusive control, transfer the collateral pursuant to the written instructions of the secured party. Alternatively, a control event notice may be given by the chargeor, where the chargeor is the defaulting party or affected party. Here, the chargeor has provided a statement to the secured party in respect of the early termination date pursuant to Section 6D of the ISDA Master Agreement, and either the amount under Section 6E of the ISDA Master Agreement payable to the chargeor is zero, or this amount was payable by the chargeor but has been discharged in full together with any accrued interest. This will then allow the chargeor to exercise sole and exclusive control of the accounts and the collateral by delivering a control event notice to the securities intermediary. This, however, is subject to contest rights set out in the account control agreement. The IM documentation infrastructure has the benefit of legal opinion support. For each jurisdiction where there is an ISDA opinion, there are now two supplements, a collateral provider insolvency opinion and a collateral taker insolvency opinion, extending those original ISDA opinions to cover the main template collateral agreements. Individual custodians are also commissioning opinions which may be relied on by their customers and apply to their custody documentation. There are two competing technology solutions for managing the IM process. These solutions will be released imminently to the market. Margin Exchange is an online platform created by Allen & Overy, IHS Markets and SmartDX which describes its role as providing information reconciliation, document generation, negotiation and execution, case management and a full data export. The other solution is ISDA Create, which is created by ISDA and Linklaters and describes itself as an online solution to produce, deliver, negotiate and execute documents and capture, process and store data from these documents. As of December 2018, neither solution has been fully released to the market. So, as we have covered, the scale of preparing for IM is massive from a documentation perspective. And the documentation perspective is just part of the task. Preparing operationally is massive too. This has been the first part of a series on initial margin. If you made it this far, I hope you join us for further parts. Thank you.